Hello and welcome to the show. This is a special presentation, the Free Clive Freeman panel. Clive Freeman is a man who has been in prison for a great number of years for a crime that he did not commit. He has spent a long time trying to clear his name and many people have come forward to assist him, not least a number of people that you're going to see today in this very special show. There is a petition to free Clive. We have only four days left and we would like to gain at least another six and a half thousand signatures. And you may wish to put your name to that to help an innocent man um, escape from bars and also right a wrong of the justice system. Um, the show is going to be showcased on onevsp.com as well as numerous other social media outlets, including my show um, at Richard Vobes on YouTube. So uh, we have a, an amazing panel of people who are going to tell us their connection with Clive um, and share some experiences as well as reasons why he should be free. So I'm, first of all, I'm going to start with a first group of people who have a personal relationship with him and started the campaign to free this innocent man. So I'm going to call on Terry Waite, a man who needs no introduction. Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you could tell us your relationship with Clive and how the campaign started, that would be fantastic. Well, Clive first wrote to me many years ago. I, I forget how many years ago now, but a long time ago, uh, claiming his innocence. And I received many, many letters from prisoners uh, claiming to be innocent of the um, crime for which they've been convicted. And it's extremely difficult to know how to um, decide what to do about it. Um, I know that uh, after a number of years, some prisoners firmly convince themselves that they are innocent when in fact they in fact are guilty. But in this case, this is a very different case. He was convicted for uh, a murder, which he claims he, he never committed. Um, he was given a tariff of 13 years, which means he had to serve 13 years before he would be eligible for parole. Um, he refused to admit that he, that he committed this crime, and therefore he was not eligible for parole. And so in all now, he served 33 years when he could possibly have been out after 13 years. That in itself is indicative of the fact that it's very, very doubtful whether he in fact committed to admit this crime. But furthermore, um, the original um, forensic scientist uh, gave um, uh, claimed that he uh, murdered Hardy. Since then, nine eminent uh, forensic scientists have refuted that evidence and said it could not have possibly committed murder in that way. And again, that's another evidence. So, you know, the, the chances of him being uh, a, a, a murderer are, are very, very low, negligible, really. He should be released. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Absolutely, he, he should be released. And um, we hope that uh, maybe this petition uh, will get the significant numbers so that that can happen in his lifetime because he's, he's not terribly well, as we, uh, as we know. Terry, thank you so much for, for joining us. I'd like to call on Terry Wilcock uh, now to share his thoughts. Yes, uh, I'm at Clive in prison. Um, I was released in December 13 after promising Clive that I would continue to fight for his case. Uh, we were part and parcel of a 2015 CCRC application uh, which centred around the discovery of a non-disclosure, I'm sorry, a non-disclosure uh, non uh, document, which was the first uh, and second of four post-mortem examinations by Richard Shepherd. The uh, conclusion of those two first two post-mortems 
was acute pancreatitis, probably alcohol-related. That document was non-disclosed and was hidden for 25 years when it was discovered in 14 boxes of evidence, which we sifted through page by page. It wasn't enough to uh, secure Clive's release, and that, that decision took three years to come after given priority status by the CCRC, whereby it should have had an answer within six months. It took three years. We thought it was enough, and we still think it's enough. Uh, on the third post-mortem, there then appeared, according to Dr. Richard Shepherd, some bruising to the back. He stated and claimed that those bruises were caused by uh, Clive Freeman kneeling on Mr Hardy's chest, the deceased and suffocating him uh, a, a, a term Birkin was used from Birkin Hare in 1825 two murderers in Edinburgh who did just that to uh, then sell the bodies for scientific research medical research We've now disclosed. We've now got documents and evidence to say uh, that that never happened. That scientifically, it was impossible. Uh, Professor Crow from America, after doing two thousand studies on similar cases in America, um, really, uh, that's my involvement. I started this campaign in two thousand and thirteen, and here we are today. A lot of support. A lot of people, a lot of forensic evidence, a lot of uh, professionals uh, have, have joined us. And, and here we are today. A new application is with the CCRC right now, uh, compiling uh, all the evidence considered in the past, but not given proper consideration. So we live in hope and prayer that this time the CCRC will do the right thing, the correct thing, and refer this case back to the CCRC. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Terry. I really appreciate, um, really appreciate that. Uh, James Gorin von Grozny, um, I believe, is... Uh, are you there, James? Not sure if James is there. He's um, juggling. I think he's is juggling it, with his computer, yeah. Might be, might be the internet. We're, we're recording this all on... Uh, Okay. remotely as you can imagine um and so sometimes we haven't if i can go to professor michael norton um um are you there professor norton thank you richard yeah I'm here. <clears throat> ah brilliant if you could if you, you could share your thoughts on uh, clive freeman please. well i mean like uh, terry Waite was saying i mean i was contacted by clive about 10 years ago and um you know like, like terry was saying i get dozens of letters from prisoners who are maintaining innocence and the job is <clears throat> sifting through which of these people who are claiming to be innocent are the most deserving cases to look at or the best examples to look at because there's been quite a, a bit of reference to the criminal case review commission so I think it's important to say that <clears throat> the criminal case review commission isn't very well known in Britain not many lawyers know about it even we've done research that has shown that even people who criminal defence lawyers don't really know what the Criminal Case Review Commission is. But the CCRC is this body that was set up for people who were failed by the Court of Appeal who were claiming to be innocent. So it was set up off the back of the Guildford 4 and the Birmingham 6 cases. And it was based in Birmingham as a kind of symbolic uh, reference to the case of the Birmingham 6. <clears throat> and the... For a long time now, almost 20 years, I've been trying to raise awareness of the limitations of the CCRC or outright failings of the CCRC in helping applicants who claim to be innocent. So the problem with the CCRC is that there's a, there's a clause within its statute and it was meant to be an independent body that can relook at claims of innocence and try to settle it one way or another. Like if somebody's convicted of a murder, and they didn't do it, and somebody else did it, we, the public, have a right to know about that. We need to know, should we feel sympathy for the person who's trapped in prison saying they're innocent? Or, you know, we need to know if there's a real murderer still out there at liberty. Now, in the Clive Freeman case, 
all the evidence suggests very strongly that no murder took place, which is a genre of miscarriage of justice I identified in my research actually 20 years ago, where people are convicted for murders that never happened. Now, the CCRC clause says that it can only refer a case back to the Court of Appeal if it thinks there's a real possibility that the Court of Appeal will overturn the conviction. And in Clive Freeman's case, on four occasions now, it's rejected applications, despite the fact that you have this growing number of expertise saying that no murder took place, that Mr Hardy could not have been murdered in the method that was claimed by Dr Shepherd. And the CCRC have misunderstood that evidence in the way that Terry Wilcock just said, because what they've been doing is they've been looking at this new evidence that's been uh, submitted and it's been saying, but it was argued at trial by a forensic scientist on behalf of Mr. Freeman that Mr. Hardy wasn't murdered. And it sees this new evidence as just more of the same. It doesn't see that it's fresh evidence but from fresh scientific experiments and research that wasn't available at the time of the trial. So there's the non-disclosure case that Terry Wilcock talks about, but there's also the need to look at this fresh evidence for what it is. And we believe that the fifth application now, there's real clarification of why this stuff is new and why it meets the CCRC test. But the petition that's actually been referred to is a petition to abolish the real possibility test because the CCRC now is refusing people four, five, six. I know a case where it's refused 10 times and this other person in this other case who we're not talking about today, they're also, their claim of innocence is very, very powerful. So elsewhere I've written about how when innocent people are in prison, terrorists, rapists, murderers remain at liberty, wrongful liberty to commit further crimes. So that's why it's crucial that people get concerned about wrongful convictions and, and look into this case, look into the articles that have been written about Clive Freeman and, and sign the petition to make the system better, not just for Clive Freeman, but for all of the victims of wrongful convictions. Well said. Yeah, very well said. And uh, Professor um, Michael Norton's been on the show with me in the past and we've uh, spoken at length about wrongful convictions and and how that can be a very one-sided thing and very hard to correct so thank you so much professor norton i'd like to go to father hugh sinclair now please a catholic priest uh, to talk about um uh, your perspective on clive uh, is uh, is is uh, father hugh sinclair with us yeah, I hope so. Well, can you... Ah, oh, there he is. Thank yeah. you so much. OK, sorry. Um, yeah, um, I've known Clive um, probably for well over 30 years. Um, at the time I, I met him, I was the um, Catholic chaplain at Wormwood Scrubs Prison in London, and um, it was uh, there that I came across him not long after his conviction. And through the course of the years, I've got to know him um, and have helped him in whatever way I could, um, getting lawyers and uh, for, um, also contacting forensic scientists who were prepared to help him. Um, I suppose, it, um, as has been said by someone else, yeah, very often um, we, we find people in prison who um, say they're innocent. Um, many of them aren't, and um, it takes time to get to know um, people and over the years I kind of um, was able to um, speak to Clive at some length he showed me all the sort of paperwork he had he was absolutely um, determined to prove his innocence and um, throughout the course of um, the last 30 odd years I've followed him around the country <laughs> from prison to prison I, in fact, saw him last Friday uh, where he, he is in prison down this way. And um, obviously uh, we've been in correspondence too. And um, um, I also speak to him quite often on the telephone. But the big thing I think is that um, 
throughout the course of it all, he has a, it's like an encyclopedic knowledge of his case. And I've just become more and more convinced of his innocence. And then um, this has been um, backed up too by my conversations with various lawyers who've represented him and particularly with the scientists who've been involved in this case, three of whom um, have been absolutely tremendous in his behalf. Um, Professor Knight, Professor Birch <coughs> and uh, Professor Crane. Um, and I've also seen the, um, the papers that have um, been produced by the Americans. Um, so um, it's desperate seeing this man who is almost as old as I am now. <laughs> We're both in our 80s and he is unwell. And um, I would just want to um, encourage anyone with any interest in the issue of justice to to learn about this case. And um, yes, if you're a Christian, I'd ask you to pray for him too, because as I say, he's not well physically, he is sick. And um, I just want to see this man set free um, before it's too late, because he is um, a serious, um, this case is just such a serious case of miscarriage of justice, in my opinion. Um, so I think, um, I can leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Father Hugh Sinclair. Absolutely. Um, a, a dreadful situation, as we have uh, been discovering. So uh, let's go and find out a little bit about um, Clive uh, in the past, before he went to prison. Um, he was in, uh, he was fighting in Rhodesia. Um, and there's a number of people in the special forces who uh, we're also doing similar things and know about this period. I want to turn to John Padbury, who wrote uh, this book, um, which is the special branch victory in an unwinnable war from 1965 to 1979. Uh, John, are you are you there? And can you can you tell us something about this period and what Clive was doing? Oh, hello. Yeah, I was in the Special Branch during that Rhodesian Civil War, um, based really in in the Centus uh, um, Rosapi, the eastern districts, and then in the western part of the country. Um, uh, Clive was in the Grey Scouts, which was a mounted infantry, a mounted division of the security forces. My wife's cousin was actually in the Grey Scouts and, and killed in an action during that war. So I identify with him as a former vet, really, um, and in a, a really brutal war. I met, I haven't met um, Clive, but I've met him through Terry uh, and various circumstances through my brother. But what interests me um, in, in this was the, the, the mention of a, a, a process called burking, which is the what was a, a, spoken to pre earlier on. And I have checked with members of all the regiments that I could get hold of, which included the SAS, the Salute Scouts, the Rhodesian Light Infantry, Rhodesian African Rifles. Um, and there is a video from a, a member of the Grey Scouts. And we know nothing about this process of burking so it certainly wasn't something that he was trained in um when he was a member of the forces but it's just a process we don't know anything about so i think that, that that's quite relevant but I, what also interests me is i was prior to joining the special branch i was in the criminal investigation department cid crimes of violence and i dealt with murders and rapes etc and of interest is the fact that i don't know what the process is here in the uk but um, in what was then Rhodesia at the time, now Zimbabwe, the investigating officer attended all the um, all post mortems of the of, of the, the 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 crimes. So we would bring all our side of intelligence and information uh, into the post mortem, and it, the the examination was carried out and and concluded. So I found it interesting that that um, there were in fact three reports in this case. 
I, I can't comment further than that, but I do find that particularly interesting. And in in the in the um, in the writing of my book, there's two things that came through to me in in the recording of of history and going back into actions. And one is that opinions, opinions, rumors, assumptions, and truth carry the same weight today, which is a grave injustice. Um, and also, I do believe that truth pursues the lie. So I think there is hope for, for Clive. I would encourage people to at least get him a fair hearing in this process. And I do, we all do pray and wish him all the very best, particularly with his fading health. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, interesting times, of course. Um, very kind of you to come on and, and talk about that. I'd like to go to Chris Thrall, if I may now, um, who is an ex-Royal Marine. Chris, are you there? I certainly am, Richard. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for uh, coming on board. Um, yes, if you could tell us a, a little in your own words, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Richard. So I met Clive on the telephone following an introduction from Aaron. Um, I was a bit hesitant to get involved in today because I thought to understand the complexities and the intricacies of this case, I'd be reading for sort of three or four weeks. And if I couldn't do that research, I couldn't do this gentleman justice. However, after reading for about six minutes, it starts to become uh, patently obvious that there's some something's not quite quite right here. Um, and uh, the couple of things that I I wanted to point out, and just following on from John's point, so I was in UK uh, elite forces, and. Um, People always hold the forces in this high esteem, often on a pedestal we really didn't deserve to be on. And it might come as some, some surprise to know, having undergone the toughest infantry training in the world, we did one afternoon of unarmed combat. And it wasn't aimed at taking out an enemy because as our instructor said to us if you get caught beyond enemy lines without a weapon <laughs> and just your fists to protect yourself um you got a bit of a problem so how about a teacher how to have a good punch up down at the boozer and and that's that's what we did um and the reason i'm saying this is i i can imagine how swayed a jury would be having this special forces um you know uh, banner put up and then being told that there's this ultra ninja technique called burking that all special forces know. It's um it I mean, obviously I I haven't been in the Grey Scouts uh in, in Rhodesia as it was back then, but I I I think that alone, the the manipulating of the jury's mind in that area, um the the case should be reviewed on 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 this point but then um one of my other hats is i'm a substance misuse specialist or i certainly worked in a um a kind of uh, community clinic for for three years and one thing that we are always acutely aware of and war warning our clients or patients uh, about was mixing drugs and alcohol simply because uh opiates and benzodiazepines, when mixed with alcohol, um, they have a very, uh, they suppress breathing or they relax the chest muscles um, or the diaphragm so much that someone can can um, li literally just stop breathing. And when I saw in one of the videos, the mention of, um, was it diazepam? Again, another red flag. And following on from that the the bruising the the um it's it's not even just perfectly normal it, it's kind of it, it it goes with the territory that if you've got a chronic alcohol problem 
And I heard mention of three and a half bottles of whiskey in a day uh, in Mr. Hardy's case. You're, you're probably going to be covered um, head, head to toe in bruises. So, yes, that's uh, that's my contribution. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, an interesting insight in the misuse of uh, those sort of things. Let's go to uh, Neil Petrie, if we may now. Uh, one vote away. He is not 100% convinced in petitions um, and finds that he, well, wants to start a block vote. I wonder if, you, Neil, you could tell us um, a little bit about that if you're there and you could just turn your camera on would be um, a great help. Neil. I can see you there, but uh, um, here he comes. Hello, Neil. Are you are you there? Are you receiving us? Hello. Sorry, I missed uh, that. D don't worry, Neil. Yeah, I can hear you now, Richard. Oh, OK. Um, well, we can't see you, but we can hear you, which is the most important part. I understand that um, you're not that keen on or you don't have much faith in petitions, but you want to start a block vote. Is that right? No. Um, yeah. In terms of petitions, they don't have much effect politically in reality. There are a lot of petitions go through Parliament and uh, they're just a distraction from the real system, of, a direct system of democracy, um, such as the Swiss have, where you have a hybrid system where you have part representative and part direct. So the petitions are, have their uses, but they're also just, a, in reality, a distraction from getting uh, real justice in a case like this. So um, uh, just wondering first, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can uh, hear you. Yeah. You so, pl plough on. Yeah, that's the background. I said that, and then, of course, <laughs> the connection disappears. I do apologise for that, ladies and gentlemen. Neil, it's a, it is a bit of a dodgy line. I'm, I'm going to um, carry on, if that's OK. Um, and I'd like to talk to a number of people now who've uh, covered... Uh, Clive's situation either in articles or on video in the media basically and I'd like to start with Dr Tess Lowry from the World Council for Health. Um, Tess, I, I know you're there, I can see you there, um, you're muted at the moment but uh, I'm sure you'll sort that out. Here we are. Hello Tess. Hello Richard uh, and Thank hello, hello to the rest of the panel. Um, I, I met uh, Clive Freeman a couple of months ago, and uh, and I don't know him well, but I'll tell you what intrigues me, because I really am of the opinion, as I get older, that things happen for a reason. Now, we have a situation where we have an old man who's been, who claims to be have been wrongfully imprisoned for murder for m more than 30 years now, and um, one has to ask, why is this being presented to us now as the public to um, to push forward? And clearly, uh, you know, I did an article and I interviewed Professor Norton, uh, and the public engagement in this issue was so so little. Um, and uh, you know, there's the petition that's that's um, been circulated, and it and uh, it's it's it received a mere sort of three thousand or so signatures, and ten thousand are needed. So the purpose of this is to get those extra 7,000. But how do we engage a population that really um, has, uh, has a blunted uh, emotion at this point, is really very far from, from you know, the, our, our, uh, the compassion that's needed in this instance? And, uh, and in actual fact, who can blame them? Because people they love are sick and dying from the COVID vaccines. Uh, and and uh, and suffering from ill health um, for other reasons, and so you know how does one engage people in a, in a, in the case of a of a man a single man when so much is going wrong all around the world? So I would like to share my perspective on this. Now we have a man whose name is Clive Freeman. In his name, what what really is curious to me is he has the words basically spelling live free man, 
which is the very essence of what we all should be as human beings. We all desire to live free and free from the shackles of, you know, of, of the humdrum existence. But here we have a man who's really imprisoned uh, in, in a real, uh, real life uh, bars uh, for, you know, and, and his name is, is Live Free Man. So, so is this just the universe playing a joke on us or is the universe and, the, and God asking us to look deeply into what's going on here. And, uh, and for me, the, the, what people should be really interested in here is, is this is a real life drama. This is full of intrigue and uh, it's really worth being curious. So I would like to appeal to people's curiosity. Um, what is going on when we have a man who's wrongfully imprisoned for a murder that he didn't commit and didn't happen, but who has, I understand, killed people in the past in a military capacity. So we have the situation where we have crimes against human beings being facilitated in the name of, of war or imperialism, um, but we have... Um, but, we, but there are laws uh, that seem to regulate when man can kill someone or not. Uh, Clive was, was uh, enabled to kill someone under orders from somebody, but, uh, but now he's wrongfully imprisoned for a murder he didn't commit. So, so in order to get those 7,000 signatures, I would like to appeal to your curiosity. Let's further the interest in this case because let's let's get the CCRC the review board to, to, um, to respond and reevaluate his case. And in the meantime, let's explore not only what happened when I was in the military, that the universe and God is asking us to relook at this, this, uh, this duality that we have in respect to harms that we bring on other people, but, but let's use it to reflect on, on really what it means to be a human being and, uh, and uh, consider, you know, the, these terrible crimes that are committed and are still being committed all around the world in the name of war. So, so that is my appeal. I'm appealing to your curiosity. Let's find out what is it? Could Clive have been framed? Is there some reason why he's sitting behind bars? What went on in Rhodesia uh, in the name of war and imperialism? Let's, let's, just get this case into the into the the limelight a little bit, and uh, and ask for an exchange from Clive to reveal what it is that we need to really look at in this case um, uh, as as a as a collective because uh, it it has to be the the, the the there has to be a redemption story in this not just for Clive but for the whole of humanity and that is that is my um, my feeling on this. Thank you so much, Tess. Yes, absolutely. The, I mean, the irony of his name must uh, not have been missed by the authorities as well as anybody else who's been interested in this case. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to go over to Anthony Weber, if I may, who has uh, written uh, pretty extensively and um, been pushing the petition. Anthony, are you there? Hello, Richard. Um, Hello. Yes, uh, Tess made some very interesting points there, and I don't think I'm going to add or to repeat the, the many positive things which have already been said uh, about the situation with Clive uh, Freedom, uh, Freeman. And uh, I, I think, you know, like a lot of the other speakers, it's an absolute travesty what has happened. Um, now, if we look at petitions, yes, I have been involved with a lot of petitions. So um, I have to say, uh, in many respects, they do work. Uh, and of course, we've had two on who, um, both of which are, are in the actual parliamentary debatable situation. But you, you can't just assume just because you have the right for, uh, I'd say, 10,000 signatures uh, to have a government reply and 100,000 signatures for a parliamentary debate, you can't assume that suddenly you're going to get everything your way because, uh, you know, in, if you look at some of the parliamentary petitions, there's a lot of petitions which we probably wouldn't even agree with. 
But uh, the key thing is it's an exercise of democracy. It's a tool we can use to uh, ensure that there is fairness and justice in society. Now, if we look at this petition, I think if we all really try hard over the next few days, it actually isn't mission impossible to get the uh, 10,000 signatures because a lot of these things, uh, people sign them if somebody they respect asks them to sign it. Uh, so let's see what happens. Now, if it doesn't uh, achieve the 10, there's a very strong argument to have another petition, just slightly different wording, and this is a tactic which a number of campaigns have used quite successfully. Uh, I've been involved with uh, one in particular, which has had two petitions, uh, the second more than the first. So um, it, it is important to highlight this. And um, of course, this petition has come at a time when people are focusing on many other important uh, petitions. So it is difficult. But we, we need to focus, because it does say abolish Section 13 of the Court Appeal System. And we need to explain what that is all about, the fact that there are many miscarriages of justice, and uh, it's in the nature of uh, the British public, indeed humanity generally, um, to want to have fairness in a, in a justice uh, system. Uh, so I think uh, it's very important to discuss this and, um, you know, to highlight the fact that this does need to have a fair hearing. Uh, but I think we also need in the freedom movement, because there are more and more laws being passed to restrict freedoms, that we're going to have more cases of people being unfairly or unjustly convicted. So it's even more important to have a uh, an improved appeals system. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with, with Clive, there are a lot of things in his case which were wrong. Uh, but, um, you know, there are a lot of sort of assumptions made, uh, ignoring of uh, basic facts. And um, we, we've actually had in the media recently one or two cases where people have been convicted by the media because the media have decided people are guilty before is, is it, the jury's even made a uh, decision. So it, uh, I personally think uh, that we need to look at the role of the media uh, because just say uh, the media um, came on board and supported Clive, then there'd be a good chance appeal would be heard and be successful. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to say anything more. I'm just going to say I'm going to do my very best on this. And uh, if, we, if we need another petition, I'll certainly help with the wording of that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Anthony. I really appreciate that. And uh, I can tell you, as somebody who has been watching the online safety bill going through uh, and being some, someone of a controversial nature, I'm certainly aware that uh, they may well come after people like myself. Um, very much appreciate that. I'd like to now uh, move on to Jason Leosotis, uh, if I've managed to pronounce your name correctly. I hope so. Jason, are you there? Hello, Richard. Hello, Jason. Um, over to you for um, your thoughts and uh, um, experiences uh, on dealing with the media or writing articles for uh, and on behalf of Clive. Thanks, Richard. And thanks, everybody, for your good work. And thanks, Richard, for your good work being here today. Um, it's very important that we're doing this. And um, why am I here today? Well, my conscience makes me come here, really. And I'm here, but like Tess, really, to 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 appeal to to good people uh, um, to do the right thing. And um, I've been attacked myself by by I won't say which media, but a couple of different medias. I've been banned from YouTube for doing the right thing. So a lot of the time, people don't do the right things through fear of criticism, and that's a big thing now. Many people won't sign the petition because they fear punishment and criticism. And I also want to appeal to people in government. 
um, in my book, The Emergency Transformation of Human Beings, I, I, I put out a call to all good people in government in one of the chapters and the media to do the right thing, because often they are controlled by the government and, and the government doesn't like to admit it's wrong, as we've seen many times with Iraq and everything else. So uh, I'm appealing to those people to, to sign and go and do a very cursory study of this case, which is obvious uh, that, that Clive is being murdered in prison. He's been, he's been accused of murder. He's been murdered himself. His family can't see him. He can't see his family. I was swimming on the beach yesterday. Clive can't do that. And time's running out for him. He, he's an elderly man now. But uh, most of all is the self-censorship thing. I, I, I was in Cape Town. I got shot at there for standing up against justice. The Mandela was in prison at the time. And I, I, I did it because I, I felt it was the right thing to do. I was outside Belmarsh Prison. I gave a talk last week about Julian Assange and um, everything like that. I did it. Why? Because it was the right thing to do. So really, it's 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 really Clive Freeman is everybody. It's all of us. And and uh, it's, it's everybody's grandfather and father. And there are people who haven't been born yet who really are relying on us now. Uh, because everything we do now or don't do creates feedback loops and consequences. In fact, it creates our reality. It creates our law system. And it's not enough to just say, I'm not going to do anything. Because if you don't do anything, that also creates the future for humanity and people who haven't been born yet, who are relying on everybody now to change this system so it doesn't happen to them. And there is a quickening. I could go on about it because that's my job. My job is to talk about justice. There is a great quickening now and a great remembering which is taking place on the planet and things that were previously done with or without wisdom and vision by governments or pathologists or anything. We see a tendency now for that. There's a speeding up of, of when the light of truth hits that information. And that's really good. Unfortunately, it's coming very light, late for someone like Clive Freeman, but there is a quickening now and, and, and the truth is coming forward more and more. And that's very exciting. And we literally have to change the system. I see it like manual override, on an airplane that's normally on automatic pilot, and we need to change it to manual override now to, so we can change previous laws that have been put in place that are now uh, um, bad for people who, 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 who are in situations like, like Clive. But I, I could go on and on, but I appeal to people not to worry about self-censorship. People have told me when I was uh, being crucified by the media, they pulled away from me and they've told me, Jason, I'm not going to, uh, be involved with you now or like what you do or your work because um, I don't want to be um, um, punished and censored. So I appeal to everyone to look at this case. It's very important. And um, it's not just about Clive, it's about you, because you, you, it could be you next. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, none of us are off the hook. Thank you, Jason, so much uh, for coming on and, and giving us your views. Uh, we're going deep into the woodland now to speak to Simon Woodlander. Simon. Hello, Richard. Hello, Simon. Thanks for joining us. I know, like uh, me, you're a YouTuber and uh, that you've had an interest in Clive for quite some time. Yeah, well, I'm not going to speak too much about Clive. You've already heard from members of the clergy, from journalists, from members of the armed forces, from professors. It's fairly obvious to anyone who reads about this case that Clive is in prison unjustly, that he didn't commit a crime. In fact, that no crime was committed. What I want to do is talk to the people watching this video. Because we live small lives. We go about our everyday life and very rarely get an opportunity to actually make a difference. All too often, the government cracks down on anything we try to do. We've seen more and more restrictions on our freedoms over the last three years. And yet here we are presented with an opportunity to actually make a difference. To get a man released from prison in the last days of his life. And not just that, but by removing Clause 13, 
actually make it a workable system for other people who are unjustly convicted. And it is, it's something I've been thinking of about a lot recently. Clive's not very well. Clive's got cancer. And this will hit home with a lot of people. Many of us would have had relatives or friends who have had cancer. Many of them would have died. And it leaves you in a position of complete and utter helplessness. There's nothing you can do. And here, again, is that opportunity to actually be able to do something that costs you nothing. Two minutes to sign a petition that if we all sign, can probably get that man released from prison and can change legislation to help other people in the same position. Two minutes. So to every single person that watches this, take two minutes. Take the opportunity to actually make a difference. Thank you so much, um, Simon. Really appreciate it. Very strong words. And you're quite right. It, it takes so little time, and yet it can make a huge difference. Um, thank you, Simon Woodland. No problem. See you soon, Richard. Yeah, see you soon. Um, so, uh, just got a couple more people on the panel uh, to go through. I'd like to talk uh, to people who uh, perhaps are new to Clive and are ready to uh, promote and talk about him. Uh, first of all, uh, Liam Galvin, who runs a crime podcast, be interested to hear your views on this um, interesting and, and, as we've heard, terrible situation. Liam, are you there? Yes, I am. And uh, thank you very much, Richard. And, and uh, what an esteemed panel who uh, talk such good sense, such, such wonderful people. Um, obviously, I am a YouTuber and I don't have the knowledge of everyone else. I don't know uh, Clive personally, but I think my role is, you know, it's a fairly big channel. We have a lot of subscribers, um, is to highlight this petition. So I urge any of the people who watch this, who watch my channel to sign this petition. As uh, Woodlander, the gentleman before, said, it, it only takes a couple of minutes of one's time. But I think the important point is why why are people going to sign the petition? I think, say, for viewers of my channel who may not be as up to date as everybody else on the case, I think I would act um, in kind of Richard's role. Where normally, I'd be asking the questions. And I think in order for people to sign a petition, the important thing is knowing about the person, the person you, you, know, you want to sign for. Um, and I don't know if the, the uh, panel have time to talk about uh, Clive as a person. How has he coped with this terrible situation that he's had uh, in prison? You know, has he uh, has he gone to the edge? Has he, has he been able to get through it? So people who, who know him uh, may be able to give uh, an insight to the people of my channel who are watching this. Um, I'd also like to know what are the actual chances of him being released um, and uh, on the basis of ill health and what he is going to do with that time. Uh, and, and finally, um, I think it's important to know if he should pass away, is this something that the panel and his family uh, and friends will continue to do to uh, establish his innocence? And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Liam. And um, it would be great. I'm sure many of the panellists here would be only too um, happy to come on your show and discuss um, all those questions that, that you had, uh, that you've had just there. Um, finally, my last uh, member of the panel to talk is Ron, uh, Rob Babalu-Joy, who uh, joins me now. Um, I see you're there, Rob. And again, you're not somebody who, you're quite new to this case, but um, you have a more spiritual um, thoughts on this, I understand. 
Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, well, I've I've literally been introduced to this by Aaron, who I met in Stroud a couple of months ago, and uh, it's heart wrenching, totally heart wrenching that a man who for thirty six years has been languishing in jail, thirteen years was how long he would have been convicted without, uh, and then would have had chance of parole had he said he was guilty, which would have been going in accordance with the prison uh, system you know, and showing remorse and all of that. But the fact that he's actually protested his innocence now for, what is that, 36 minus 30, 20, 23 years, something like that, 20 years or more, protested his innocence since then. And if he if he was to just say he was guilty, then he would be able to be released. But that tells me everything I need to know about the man's innocence. Because you won't condemn yourself to being you know to being a called a guilty man if you know you're innocent and you'd rather spend that time in jail because of your own heart and what is right and just and people have mentioned about the problems in the justice system well if there's no justice for one man or one woman or one child there's no justice for anyone so i would suggest that we all have to be somewhat outraged when we hear cases like this enough that we do spend the time not only just to sign a petition but if you have a channel if you have a means of word of mouth even you know sharing the news about this with your loved ones with friends getting it out there and making it very obvious that things need to change and again we're the ones who will do that not the system itself they'll never change it by without the pushback from the public um, I've written down a couple more little points that came up. I loved what Anthony said, you know, around needing a better appeals process. But I'd go further and say that there are so many unjust laws that are being uh, implemented, not least in the last few years. And you mentioned the online censorship one um, that we need really to repeal these laws completely and go back to common law, natural law, which is do no harm. And in this case, certainly, I don't see Clive has done any harm and yet still he remains in jail. We also need to return to the idea that everybody has the right to a jury in any criminal case, in any civil case. And this is um, being sort of stripped. They're, they're getting rid of juries as much as they can, because actually a jury of your peers is going to be much fairer than the system itself, which has no alignment with morality or eth uh, ethical practice in many cases at this point today. Um, I would also say, you know, what Jason said, do what you know to be right and be much more afraid in these times of not using your voice while you have one. And remember what, as Jason was talking about with feedback, feedback loops, what that means for your children, because if you don't use your voice now, they will not have a voice. Plain and simple. We have the chance to turn all of this around. There are many things all sort of weaving together now about justice, education, um, health, finance, everything in our reality has been somewhat turned upside down or inverted. And we have the opportunity now to come together in ever greater numbers, and it is happening exponentially more so, to turn it all around. And it starts with each and every one of us who has that voice and the knowing inside of what is right. Absolutely. So that, that's that. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. So thank No, thank you so much, Rob. Um, uh, really appreciate everybody on the, the panel coming forward. We do live in a very corporate Britain. Sovereignty um, has seems to have uh, gone down the plug hole. We definitely need to do that back uh, and we but at the same time we must use the tools that are available such as the petition that is there before i wind up um we've been talking for 40 uh, 54 minutes on this uh, this case this individual clive freeman is there anyone from the panel who just would like to make one other point that they didn't i know uh, neil um unfortunately your signal was a, a bit poor if you wanted to come back now's your opportunity or if anybody else wanted just to say a few final things before we we wrap up. I would like to, Richard, very briefly, if I can. Yes, uh, of course. It's two just very general points, which are so serious, and, and, and Rob's reminded me now, sorry. You know, 
uh, I talked about Julian Assange before. Basically, what what's happening with technology? Like you said, we need people to decide, not technology, because with censorship now, what's happening is you can literally have your tongue cut out. And in the older days, that's what they used to do: was cut people's tongues off when they were, were trying to speak the truth and help other people. So, very briefly, that's all I've got to say. If we don't speak now, with technology becoming AI and everything censoring us. Uh, we won't be able to defend people like this. So for, for the people who haven't been born yet, for your grandchildren and children, do it now. Absolutely. But well, yeah, the AI is something that is uh, worrying a lot of people. Um, before we go, is there anybody else? Um, who yeah, wishes... if I could. Of course, Neil. Neil Peach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I'm just travelling on the train, so it's been difficult. Um, yes, yeah, of course. The, the petition angle is quite clear. You know, it's... Uh, it's the best we can do under the circumstances. You know, and I'm a former investigator, so with this particular case, I was most concerned about all of the reports coming in from apologists that are ignored. And it's indicative, I think, obviously, of the app that, you know, we deal with on the voting side uh, is the type of thing that will help in the future to, you know, bring these types of cases to the public's attention more readily and more swiftly, and yet we can take action. But we do need a different system. I agree with all those people who are talking about issues with the system and uh, you know, moving forward a party apparatus and system that we have to do at the moment. Until we get that day, we're going nowhere, I'm afraid. So that would be my point. So I wish him all the best, and I'll obviously wish that the petition worked. Um, but uh, unfortunately, under the current system, we've got a real fight in our hands. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. Uh, Travelling there, and of course the signal breaking up there, essentially I think Neil saying that, the, we, again, um, we have to use what we've got, but the system itself... Um, is pretty much broken and we need another system. I'd like to say a big thank you to all members of the panel who've uh, taken time out of their day to talk to us about Clive Freeman. The link will be in the description of this video and with all the other um, uh, social media links that this video will generate. To remind you, it's showcased on onevsp.com as well as other members here on the panel sharing it. Um, we hope that it makes a difference to Clive and that before he, uh, his, his life comes to a, an end that he can, as his namesake says, live a free man for the last times of his life. I thank you for indulging us with your time. Please have a look at the petition and um, if you feel that uh, it can make a difference, that we can all make a difference to not only Clive's life but the future lives of other people, then please, you know what to do. Um, and if you're watching on the Richard Vobe show, I'll be back with more monologues and guests, as indeed I'm sure will all the other contributors. Thank you for watching, and from us all, goodbye and good luck to Clive. <laughs>